summer, 1943, eastern Poland. The sounds of screams and shouts and the barking of dogs fills the air as a large group of naked Jewish people are beaten and chivied down a heavily wooded path. What was waiting for them at the end of that path was far worse than they could possibly imagine. Today, on the one-year anniversary of the channel, Descent into Darkness revisits Aktion Reinhard in Sobibor, The End of the Line. Background and Construction Whilst I have already covered the full build-up to Aktion Reinhard in other videos, for newer viewers I shall give a brief overview, a recap of how it came about. Essentially, the final solution began in a large conference room at the Villa Am Grossen in the Berlin borough of Wannsee on the 20th of January 1942. Here, Reinhard Heydrich and other high-ranking Nazi officials sought a more workable answer to what to do with Europe's Jewish population that they hated so. They heard reports from the Einsatzgruppen assigned to the Ostfront that had been rounding up and murdering many tens of thousands of Jews, communists and other perceived undesirables, taking them away and murdering them. I have made a full video on this aspect of the war, link in the description. This very hands-on style of murder had proven highly problematic for the men involved though. Many had been suffering from severe cases of highly disturbed mental behaviour, what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. It was therefore felt that a more efficient and less damaging way to eliminate their ideological enemies must be found. Experiments conducted during the Mass Euthanasia Programme, Action T4, had showed the effectiveness of carbon monoxide poisoning using exhaust fumes from specially adapted vans. There had also been a report from the camp at Auschwitz that had conducted a small-scale experiment in the use of Zyklon B pesticide in the basement of the punishment block known as Block 11. This had proven highly successful, if a little crude, as it was difficult to convert the basement rooms to being gas-tight, but it was felt that purpose-built units would be much more satisfactory. The meeting therefore decided upon the whole-scale murder by gassing of all Jews in the areas in which Germany controlled. They could further fund the Reich's evil machinations by looting the possessions from those they killed and have it all sent back to the main security office in Berlin. Six sites were chosen in occupied Poland for this new plan, three of which had already established concentration camps, Auschwitz, Chilno and Majdanek. These would have a new subcamp built that would encompass gas chambers. Three more sites were chosen that purely dealt with extermination. These need only be very small camps, as the intention was to kill nearly everyone within a short space of time upon their arrival. These would be at Belzec, Treblinka and Sobibor. Four men would be sent to Sobibor to plan the new construction. These were Richard Tomala, Erich Fuchs, Gustav Wagner and Karl Frenzel. More on the latter two later. Tomala was in overall charge of planning and design for the new camp. He had previously designed the Belzec camp and had realised a few limitations in that site. With Sobibor, he gave a slightly larger footprint, leaving plenty of room to house everything the camp would need. The extermination area was set far back into the woods, away from and out of sight of the reception area. Once built, Tomala would play no further part in its history, returning to the administration department building in Lublin. Erich Fuchs was responsible for the specific construction of the gas chamber, having previously been involved in the building and adaptation of such facilities during Action T4. Fuchs acquired an engine from either an old armoured vehicle or a tractor that had been brought from the city of Lvov. He mounted this engine on a concrete base beside the chamber and connected the exhaust to a series of pipes that led inside. One of the first gassings of around 40 Jewish women was witnessed by the camp staff and higher-ups and was considered satisfactory and fit for purpose. The original gas chamber was made of wood, but later this was demolished and replaced with a brick installation as the wood had become nigh on impossible to clean. They oversaw the 850,000 square yard construction, paying particular attention to the extermination area. The local Judenrat, or Jewish Council, was approached in the nearby town of Vlodova and was ordered to send around 150 of their strongest men to help construct the camp. These men were worked hard and treated appallingly. 
Once the camp was finished, almost all of them were shot, but two men managed to escape and returned to their home. They told the Judenrat of what had happened and what the camp was to be used for, but they were not believed. I mean, the Germans had always been so nice to them up until now, right? The whole perimeter was bordered by a double barbed wire fence with tree foliage interwoven to disguise the interior from view to anyone outside. Further areas outside the fence were peppered with landmines. A rail spur siding was built to accommodate the arriving transport trains so as not to interrupt the regular flow of traffic. The SS accommodation area at the camp entrance next to the ramp, named the Vorlager, were made to look like a picturesque village. This was to fool the new arrivals into thinking that their struggles and strife would soon be over. Well, it would be, but for the most hellish of reasons. Some of the buildings in the Vorlager were pre-existing, such as an old post office, which was the officer's accommodation. All of these buildings were given cutesy-sounding names such as Lustiger Flor, meaning the Merry Flea, and Schwalbenetzt, or the Swallow's Nest, Nicely hand-painted signs, neat gravel paths, patios and well-tended and regimented gardens and window boxes all added to the illusion of safety and calmness. The Vorlager also contained other amenities and amusements to make the SS staff lives more bearable, such as a bowling alley, a hair salon and canteen that would all be staffed by prisoners. Behind the Vorlager was another compound, simply called Lager 1. A smaller subsection of this was known as Erbhof, or Family Farm. This contained the administration block, as well as, as the name would imply, a small farm that kept geese, pigs, chickens, and grew fruits and vegetables. Erbhof also contained a makeshift pharmacist dispensary, stocked by the various medicines found amongst the possessions of those they murdered. The administration block building was another pre-existing structure that had been used by the Polish Forestry Authority. Lager 1 also contained a bakery, a mechanic, a carpenter, a tailor, and a signwriter's workshops. By the end of the camp's operation, there was a fourth lager under construction next to the extermination area that would be used as a weapons dump that would deal with captured Soviet weapons and recondition them to be used by the Germans and their collaborating forces. This area was incomplete by the time the order to dismantle the camp came through. Operations Gassing operations began at Sobibor in May 1942. The trains would arrive on an almost daily basis, bringing with them thousands of people, primarily Jews who had been told that they were being evacuated further east. Upon arrival and the train being shunted into the spur, the doors were opened and the passengers disembarked. There were many in each of the cattle trucks that had been too sick or weak and had died at some point in the journey. The people were packed in so tightly into the trucks that the dead remained standing until the crush was finally relieved. The ramp at Sobibor had a PA system installed that allowed the playing of light music from a phonograph in a cynical ruse to help calm the nerves of the new arrivals. They would be assisted down from the train by other Jews who were assigned to the ramp. The men, women and children would be separated by the screaming guards who would pull, shove and beat people into their respective groups. All the while, each person would be quickly questioned if they had any trades or specialisms, such as tailors, watchmakers, goldsmiths, blacksmiths, gunsmiths, carpenters, seamstresses, and so on. In other camps, such as Auschwitz, being selected meant that you were to be gassed immediately, whereas in the Reinhard camps, being selected meant that you were to live, at least for now. The music was stopped, and the guards called for silence. Then... A senior SS man on duty would address the crowd in a calm voice, welcoming them and saying that they had arrived at a transit camp and would soon be on their way to a labour camp that would be their new permanent home. But first, they had to ensure that the spread of lice and diseases must be limited, and so they must all go through a compulsory delousing and bathing. This put the majority of the crowd at ease. They were encouraged to leave their possessions where they were, and they would be able to retrieve them later. They were further told that any monies, jewellery or valuables should be surrendered in exchange for a receipt to redeem them later. Of course, all of this was a lie. Those who answered yes to the questions of trade skills were told to stay behind, whilst the rest were led away to the camp proper. The first area 
was to shave the heads of all the new arrivals. This would be done at the double-quick time, and would not exactly be a quality new do. Once this was complete, the two separate groups of males and females would be led to their own shed, where they were ordered to strip completely naked. The men would be ordered out first, then followed by the women and children. They were chivied down a long, narrow path. This led in an inverted J-shape to the next and final area of the camp. Like Treblinka, this path was alternately known as either der Schlauch or the Tube, or more insidiously, die Himmelsstrasse, the road to heaven. Once they were through the gates at the end of this path, the men would be ordered into a large building disguised as a bathhouse. They would all be crammed in, and the door closed and locked behind them. The men inside would be plunged into total darkness, no doubt causing much panic. Outside, an SS man would strike up the internal combustion engine. Not long after, screams from inside would begin as people began suffocating from carbon monoxide poisoning. The panicked screams would, in turn, use up even more of what oxygen was in the room, thus hastening everyone's inevitable demise. The process would last around 20 to 40 minutes, depending on the number of people inside. Meanwhile, outside, the women and children could hear everything. Panic and screams would further break out amongst them, until they were barked into silence by shouts from the guards or gunshots. Once everyone inside was dead, doors on the other side of the building were opened and the gas allowed to disperse for a very short time. Then, the men of the Zonderkommando, or special unit, ventured in and dragged the corpses out. The Zonderkommando were made up of the healthiest and strongest men from each new arrival, whose job it would be to dispose of the dead. Initially, mass burials were carried out, but this soon changed to open-air cremation instead. They were stacked alternately with layers of wood, on top of a steel grate made from railway rails. A few splashes of petrol would begin the blaze. The pyres would burn around the clock to get rid of the evidence of thousands murdered. The Zonderkommando would be regularly liquidated, and new ones chosen from the next arrival as a way of not allowing them to become too familiar with the layout of the camp and figuring out a means of escape, and thus being a witness to the crimes that went on there. The Zonderkommando allocated to the extermination area had their own separate accommodation hut inside Lager 3 and would never be allowed to leave the area unless escorted by guards to ensure that they did not talk to anyone else in the main camp population. Staff As you can imagine, the calibre of men that this kind of work attracted were not exactly ever going to win hearts and minds. Here are some of the main players from Sobibor. Franz Stangl Born on the 26th of March 1908 in Austria, Stangl had begun his murderous ways during Aktion T4, being posted to the killing facility at Hartheim. He became the first commandant at Sobibor, where he quickly gained a reputation for his rigid and efficient running of the camp. He was not very often seen around the camp, preferring to stick to the administration block, in which he excelled. Whenever he was seen, he liked to wear a white SS tunic compared to the usual black. This led to him acquiring the nickname the White Death. Stangl was transferred to the extermination camp at Treblinka a few days after the sacking of Dr. Emfred Eberl for gross inefficiency on the 1st of September 1942. Franz Karl Reichleitner Reichleitner was born on the 2nd of December 1906 in the former Austria-Hungary. Sadly, with my limited resources, I was unable to find a great deal about his early years before the war. SS Obersturmführer Reichleitner was appointed as Deputy Com Commandant of Sobibor under Franz Stangl. When Stangl was selected by Odilo Globocznik to take over the running of the camp at Treblinka on the 1st of September 42, Reichleitner was promoted to SS Hauptsturmführer and Commandant of Sobibor. He would remain in charge of the camp until it was liquidated. During his time at the camp, many tens of thousands were sent to be gassed as soon as they arrived. Witnesses claim that Reichleitner was much stricter than the rather standoffish Stangl. Although he was not regularly seen around the camp, preferring the confines of his office and generously appointed accommodation area. One day, upon the arrival of a new train of Jews, he coldly shot a man for striking another SS officer. This he did in front of the entire transport as a warning to others. 
He was described by one of the camp inmates, Moshe Bahir, thusly, although he overestimated his age. Reichleitner, a man in his late forties with an Austrian accent, was dressed always with great elegance and wore gloves. He did not have direct contact with the Jews and the transports. He knew that he could rely on his subordinates, who were very frightened of him. He ran the camp with German precision. During his time, the Aktionen went smoothly, and all the transports that arrived on a certain day were liquidated. He never left them for the following day. Johann Niemann Born in Wollen, Lower Saxony, on the 4th of August 1913, the son of a farmer, the young lad chose a much different career path to his old chap, instead becoming a painter and decorator. Niemann joined the Nazi party in 1931, joining the SS three years later. He served at the concentration camps at Esterwegen and Sachsenhausen, where he honed his craft of mistreating political prisoners. He became involved in the mass euthanasia program Aktion T4 at three different centres, Grafenek, Brandenburg and Bernberg. His job title was that of a Leichenverbrenner, or incinerator. Therefore, he oversaw the cremation of the bodies of the many of the disabled, homosexual and chronically sick people needlessly killed in the name of the Nazis' twisted views on racial purity. Following the public cessation of T4 and the commencement of the new initiative, Aktion Reinhard, Niemann was transferred to Belzec near Lublin and Lwów in occupied Poland as commandant of the new second camp that would become the Vernichtungslager. He would serve as the commandant of Belzec until June 1943, when the camp was liquidated. The last transports from the nearby Jewish ghettos had come in December of 42. After Belzec Zwei was liquidated, all the remaining Zonderkommando were shot, and the remaining inmates transferred to Sobibor, where Niemann had been appointed as deputy commandant. Niemann enriched himself greatly from the stolen wealth of the arriving prisoners. Every time he returned home, he would deposit sizable amounts of cash at the bank and bring nice clothes and trinkets home for his family. He ran a great risk in doing this, as such personal enrichment was considered theft from the Reich, and if caught, he would have been imprisoned and stripped of his SS rank. Karl Frenzel recalled a particular event involving Niemann that highlighted his cold indifference toward the camp inmates. A Polish capo told me that some Dutch Jews were organising an escape, so I related to Deputy Commandant Niemann. He ordered the 72 Jews to be executed. Gustav Wagner The man who would rise to become the most evil and violent and feared man in Sobibor began his life on the 18th of July 1911 in Vienna, in the former Austria-Hungary. As he grew, he gained an almost superhero-like strength and developed exceptionally long arms that hung almost down to his knees. He had a slight deformity in his shoulders that tended to leave him walking with an odd-looking gait, favouring his right side. He had trained as a mechanic and had joined the Austrian army in 1928, and three years later, in January 1931, had decided to join the Nazi party, which at this point had become a declared prescribed illegal party by the Austrian government. On the day war broke out following the invasion of Poland, Wagner took the opportunity that came up to work at the Hartheim Euthanasia Center as part of Aktion T4. Like Johann Niemann, his job was to incinerate the corpses of the murdered that the Nazi doctors had deemed Lebens und Wertes Leben, or Life Unworthy of Life. T4 is thought to have claimed the lives of around a quarter of a million people, men, women and children. I have made a full video on T4 if you'd like to know more. Link in the description. When Aktion Reinhardt came into being, Wagner was transferred to Sobibor, as his experience in dealing with bodies was thought to be an essential skill for the new camp. At one time, Wagner was overheard talking to one of his SS comrades, expressing sincere regret and disappointment that of the three Reinhardt camps, the others being Belzec and Treblinka, Sobibor was last in the number of murdered people. Wagner became renowned for his violence towards the camp inmates whom he would rule over like a vengeful god. Whenever he appeared, they all knew that something horrific was bound to happen. His weapons of choice were either an axe, a shovel, or an iron rod, or a whip. But he was not above using his bare hands to inflict dreadful beatings and killings either. He thought nothing of bringing the edge of a blade of a shovel down on a person's head, splitting their skull almost completely in half. 
Then, despite what had just happened, he would calmly turn to his colleague and chat as if nothing had happened, as if it were nothing more than swatting a fly. One of his favourite things to do was to line up a father and son and try to kill them both with the same single bullet. Whilst walking past the sorting sheds, he once glanced through the window and happened to see a young boy concealing a small tin of food. In a fit of rage, he stormed into the shed, grabbed the boy by the scruff of the neck and bellowed for everyone to assemble outside. When all the workers had lined up, he dragged the screaming child outside and in front of everyone, first found the tin can, holding it aloft for all to see. Then, he drew his pistol and shot the boy in the head. The prisoners dared not react for fear of the same fate. He then calmly ordered everyone back inside to continue working. Wagner was known for his shrewd cunning and was extremely difficult to fool. He would stalk around the camp at different times, looking for anyone he could catch out. I'm sure he would have found a welcome home in the Gestapo. Another example of Wagner's extreme brutality was to drag a woman outside who had tried to conceal her newborn baby in a shed where she was working. He forced her to her knees, placed the baby down in front of her, drew his gun and shot the infant, followed by the screaming, distraught mother. He was also known to regularly rape any of the women that he found attractive. Hermann Erich Bauer Born on the 26th of March 1900 in Berlin, Bauer would go on to play a very hands-on part in the final solution. Like so many of the eventual higher-ups' involvement in the Holocaust, Bauer was first involved in industrialised murder during Aktion T4. At first, he worked as a driver, collecting people and bringing them to the euthanasia centres, but his good work saw him promoted and made him responsible for the killing process. Upon his appointment to Sobibor, due to his experience, Bauer was put in charge of the extermination area. This led to him gaining the highly unambiguous nickname of the Gasmeister, or Gas Master. It is therefore safe to say that the vast majority of all those murdered at Sobibor were directly attributable to this one man. Karl Frenzel Born on the 20th of August 1911 at Zedenik in the district of Brandenburg, his old man worked on the railways and was a local official in, for the Social Democratic Party. Young Karl was apprenticed as a carpenter after he left school and became active in the local trade union, which makes it rather strange that he would end up joining the Nazi party who would then ban trade unions altogether. With the outbreak of war, he attempted to join the military, but the Nazi authorities had other ideas for him, assigning him to Akadion T4. After an initial check to ensure his political views were on the same line as the party and going through the orientation course, he was sent to the euthanasia facility at Grafenet Castle as a guard. Soon after, he was moved to Bernberg, where he would put his carpentry skills to good use, but then was moved once again to the killing centre at Hadamar, where he became one of the team responsible for disposing of the bodies. Sobibor would cement Karl Frenzel as a true sadistic monster, being involved in the camp from the very first day to the very last. Once the camp had been completed, Frenzel was made deputy in charge of the extermination area under Erich Bauer. In later years, Bauer said of his subordinate, He was one of the most brutal members of the permanent staff in the camp. His whip was very loose. One infamous moment in the spring of 1943 when a prisoner tried to end his own suffering by suicide and was found barely alive, Frenzel angrily bellowed that Jews had no right to kill themselves, only Germans had the right to kill. He then proceeded to whip the poor soul senseless and took out his pistol and shot him in the head. A survivor of Sobibor, Jules Shelvis, who became a historian, wrote of Frenzel, His lust for power over defenceless people was mirrored by an equally great need to ingratiate himself with his superiors. As his power grew, so did his willingness to blindly follow orders and to do more besides. He wanted to be regarded as the perfect SS man by his superiors and fellow camp staff alike. Once a man of little significance, at Sobibor, he relished his position as one of the most important men. The realisation that he was lord and master of the work Jews, to know that they were at his disposal, that he could do with them as he pleased, aroused the lowest instincts in him. He wanted to do more than he was asked to do. 
He wanted to use the opportunity to carry on a personal reign of terror by humiliating and torturing the work Jews, beating them into submission, and to kill them or have them killed. He took great pleasure in it. The full life stories of all of these men and many more can be found in my mini-series about the worst Nazi camp guards. Link in the description. As well as these men, the numbers of guards were boosted by a further 90 to 120 or so auxiliaries known as Travniki or sometimes, alternately, heavy men. These were recruited by the SS from captured Soviet POWs, most of whom were from the Ukraine and other satellite Soviet republics. They received their training at the concentration camp at Trevniki, hence their name. They were taught the art of brutality with a distinct Nazi style. For this, of course, what better subject than actual inmates of the camp? The Travnikis were put on the day-to-day -day mundane guarding duties and were not particularly respected by their SS overlords, who preferred to take advantage of the amenities that the camp had to offer. Travniki men had their own separate accommodation that was not nearly as lavish as, as the true SS men. The SS deeply mistrusted the Travnikis, but for the time being they were useful. Still, they were only ever issued a very small amount of ammunition for their weapons, just in case. Whilst the Travnikis were responsible for a lot of the low-end jobs in the camp, including leading the Jews towards the extermination area, it was always an SS man who carried out the killing process in the gas chamber. Below the Travniki men were a small number of Jews who were selected to act as overseers, called Kapos. Although they did not have any choice in the matter, Kapos were hated as much as their German captors, as they were seen as collaborating with the enemy. Being a Kapo did mean that you were treated ever so slightly better, and had better rations, but you were expected to have a high level of brutality towards anyone who dared make even the slightest mistake or rule infraction. A small retinue of around 600 prisoners were kept on hand for forced labour, including sorting through all the murdered prisoners' possessions and retrieving valuables to be sent back to the Reich Main Security Office in Berlin. Seeds of Rebellion The feeling of vengeance for their treatment at the camp had long been a deep desire of the resident inmates but a proper plan did not come to the fore until the arrival of a small group of Soviet POWs captured during the Battle of Moscow. Led by Alexander, a.k.a. Sasha Perchersky, the group were there to be used as slave labour, mostly in the logging of the nearby forest to repair and enhance the disguised fencing all the way around the camp's perimeter. Sasha had endeared himself as a true badass mofo when, only three days after the arrival of he and his men, he caught the ire of SS man Karl Frenzel. Frenzel had been looking for an excuse to beat someone, and had become so annoyed that Sasha had stopped working as Frenzel doled out a series of lashes against a Jewish worker. He beckoned Sasha over and said, You don't like the way I punish this fool? I give you precisely five minutes to split this stump. If you succeed, I will give you a packet of cigarettes. If you go over by as much as a second, you will get twenty-five lashes. He gestured towards a thick stump that stood nearby. Sasha did not hesitate. Taking up his axe, he went at the stump like a wild dervish, managing to complete the task in four and a half minutes. Frenzel, a little flustered at having been cheated out of another excuse to beat someone, begrudgingly took out a packet of cigarettes and offered it to Sasha. He refused, saying, No, thank you. I don't smoke. Frenzel stalked off, but then returned a short time later with a loaf of bread, again offering it to Pachersky, who once again refused, claiming that the rations he was given satisfy him thoroughly. Frenzel, angry at having one of the very rare occasions of his charity and generous nature snubbed, stormed off. This greatly impressed the others on the commando, although they dared not say so openly at the time. Pachersky and his men became friendly with the civilian Jewish inmates and their nominal leader, Leon Feldhendler, former head of the Judenrat in Lublin. Very soon, the rumours about what happened at the mysterious Lager 3 were shared. Slowly but surely, a plan began to formulate amongst them that an effort must be made to escape, rather than await an inevitable fate. 
Sasha's men at first did not want to involve the other Jews of the camp as their lack of military training would mean they would be much more of a hindrance. Feldhendler had spoken to Sasha and pleaded with him, as if the Soviet soldiers acted unilaterally and did manage to escape, then that would only mean severe reprisals in the form of brutal executions of all those left. Sasha was therefore convinced that it had to be everyone or no one. It was obvious that several of the SS officers would need to be killed in the build-up to the revolt of, on the day, so that the rest of the guards would be rendered leaderless, and a proper coordinated defence and counter could not be mounted, to cut off the head of the serpent, as it were. A list was soon drawn up of whom should be killed, if at all possible. Then came the task of deciding when, where, and how these men should be killed. It was clear that the inmates would need to discreetly gather weapons in the few days leading up to the intended revolt. Aside from personal sidearms, the SS men and Travniki guards had a cache of weaponry, including rifles, submachine guns and grenades and pistols, in an armory in Lagas Vai. Getting to them and, and hiding them away would be easier said than done. The group had slowly began compiling intelligence of each SS member, learning their routines and making a note of what weapons they regularly carried. Sasha's men overcame their initial reluctance to include the civilian Jews in their attempted breakout when the information they needed was already common knowledge amongst them, having been at Sobibor for far longer. Excellent news was found when both Commandant Reichleitner and the hated Gustav Wagner had left the camp to go on leave. This had been just the kind of good omen that they were hoping for in their prayers. Reichleitner would have been exceedingly difficult to get to, and Wagner's fierce cunning and ruthless streak would have no doubt sussed out the plan in an instant. The date was set for the 13th of October, but, to quote Robert Burns, the best laid schemes a mason man gang after glee. And so it was that this plan, on the very morning that the group were to begin their discreet campaign of murder, trucks arrived at the gate and out jumped a whole company of Waffen SS men. The Jews began to panic. Had they been discovered or betrayed? Word was passed around to delay until they heard different. Thankfully, the SS men seemed to have only turned up for some grub. They piled into the canteen and began to fill their faces. Sadly, it was not until mid-afternoon that the SS men remounted their trucks and left. Pechersky therefore sent out word that there was no time left for today, and that the plan would begin tomorrow instead. And so, the 14th of October 1943 was the day set for one of the greatest and most successful uprisings at a Nazi concentration camp. Our day has come. After he had been out riding his favourite horse on the morning of the 14th of October 1943, Deputy Commandant SS Untersturmführer Johann Niemann was lured to one of the huts with a promise of a new long leather coat stolen from one of the murdered Jews, and he needed his measurements taken by one of the camp tailors to fit it perfectly. When he entered the hut, Niemann was asked to remove his gun belt to better check the fit. Not suspecting a thing, he duly undid the buckle and set his belt and holster aside. Whilst he was distracted, Another inmate, Soviet POW Alexander Shubayev, who had stood behind him, raised an axe above his head. Niemann had heard movements behind him and quickly turned around, saying, Bas? Just as he did, Shubayev brought the hatchet down on the top of Niemann's head with a sickening thud. Good night, Vienna. Niemann made very little noise as he slumped to the floor, spilling brains and claret onto the planked floor. He was thirty years old. Next on the list was Rudolf Bechmann, who worked most of his time in the administration block. The conspirators in attempted to entice him away to one of the huts with an offer of a new coat, but just as he was on his way, for reasons best known to himself, he changed his mind and returned to the admin block. The group thus decided to send two men to his office and attack him there. They knocked at the door, and Bechmann invited them in. Without saying a word, the two men set upon the unsuspecting German and repeatedly stabbed him until he was no more. They left him in a pool of blood behind his desk and beat a hasty retreat. In all, around eleven SS men and a handful of the more brutal Travniki guards had been murdered and their bodies hidden around the camp. During the build-up to the revolt, Erich Bauer was identified as a key member of the SS staff that needed to be killed. But instead, 
he inadvertently had saved his skin by deciding to drive a van to the camp at Chelmno on a supply run. Upon his return and ordering the truck unloaded, he went into the admin office block to report in. He was the first to raise the alarm when he discovered the bloody corpse of his colleague Rudolf Beckmann. He stumbled out of his office and drew his pistol, and began wildly shooting at two Jews he had ordered to unload the supplies. They beat a hasty retreat. With the plan thus discovered, the uprising's leader decided to spring into action immediately, rather than wait any longer. Lead conspirator Pachersky addressed the assembled camp population. Our day has come! Most of the Germans are dead. Let us die with honour. Remember, if anyone survives, he must tell the world what has happened here. Almost the entire camp population began attacking their erstwhile captors, attempting to dismantle the perimeter fence. The remaining guards tried to stop the sea of people, but without leadership their efforts were blunted. Screams and shots filled the air, the unending tearing noise of the MG-42 machine guns in the guard towers and the unmistakable crack of rifles and pistols. Roughly 300 prisoners were able to dodge the landmines and hail of bullets and get away into the forest beyond. Aftermath Despite the cutting of the phone lines, it did not take long for higher command to get word of the revolt at the camp. Very soon, Christian Wert, second in command to Odilo Globochnik, arrived at the gates and observed the state of the camp. Immediately, Wert ordered Erich Bauer to take a vehicle and drive to Chelmno and summon reinforcements and elements of the secret police units to help round up the escapees. Bauer was reluctant to go as he greatly feared being ambushed on the road, but one did not dare question Christian Wert, so off he went. Sadly, the majority of those who got away were hunted down. Only 60 of the escapees would survive the war. This event was commemorated in the 1987 film Escape from Sobibor, and I highly recommend you watch it. It is available to watch for free on YouTube. Link in the description. When Himmler heard about the revolt, only three days after, he ordered the camp to be liquidated. Once again, Gustav Wagner and Karl Frenzel were called upon to oversee the operation. They ordered the remaining camp inmates to begin dismantling the camp and the erasure of the evidence of its existence. The Germans carried out severe reprisals for this humiliation. In a move dubbed Aktion Enterfest, or Operation Harvest Festival, that took place over the 3rd and 4th of November, approximately 39 to 43,000 Jews would be shot at the camps at Majdanek, Travniki and Ponyatova. Once the camp was completely dismantled, Trees were planted in the area formerly occupied by the gas chambers, and early mass graves were dug up, the semi-rotten corpses burned, and the ashes scattered over the land to hasten the new growth of foliage. After this was done, and the final members of the Zonderkommando were either killed or transferred to other camps. In November 1943, orders had come through that Aktion Reinhardt was to come to an end. This was presumably because of successful revolts taking place both at Sobibor and Treblinka, making the SS panic about the few witnesses of the crimes that had gotten away. The remaining SS officers and men from the Reinhardt camps were ordered to join Zondertruppe A in Trieste and Fiume, Italy. Their job in this newly created unit was to root out Italian partisans. Another unit would be created in Yugoslavia to counter insurgencies there. Many have speculated that the real reason for the creation of Zondertruppe A was to put the remaining Reinhard staff in as much danger as possible, and thus getting rid of them as potential future witnesses as well. Indeed, many men would be killed at the hands of partisans. Legacy Despite not being as famous or even as prolific as other camps in the system, Sobibor contained some of the worst animals to ever steal our precious oxygen. Whilst he did not deny his role, Frank Stangl pathetically attempted to justify the lack of guilt by saying, My conscience is clear. I was simply doing my duty. Stangl died on the 28th of June 1971 in Dusseldorf prison from heart failure at the age of 63. Former Commandant Franz Reichleitner was killed on the 3rd of January 1944 by Italian partisans near Fiume, less than three months after the Sobibor revolt. He was 37 years old. 
Sadly, Gustav Wagner was away on leave to celebrate the birth of his daughter during the Sobibor uprising. During an interview in 1979 with the BBC, Gustav Wagner was asked if he had any regrets or remorse of his actions. He answered, I had no feelings. It just became another job. In the evening we never discussed our work. We just drank and played cards. Wagner was found dead on the 3rd of October 1980 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He had a knife stuck in his chest. He was 69 years old. His death was ruled as a suicide, although rumours abound from Sobibor survivor Shlomo Schmeisner that Wagner had been murdered by clandestine agents. Erich Gassmeister Bauer died in Tegel prison in Berlin on the 4th of February 1980, at the age of 79. In his remaining years, Karl Frenzel expressed contrition for his actions and denounced Nazism, saying, Ever since 1945 I have been cursing the Nazis for everything, for what they did and everything they stood for. I fought against the devil. Since 1945 I have refrained from any involvement in politics. Frenzel died on the 2nd of September 1996, at the age of 85. Alexander Sasha Pechersky had abandoned the remaining escaped Jews despite promising to return. He and his men joined a group of Russian partisans and continued the struggle against the Nazis. Following the war, he was denied permission to attend and testify at the Nuremberg trials and again in, at the later trial of Adolf Eichmann in 1961. In 1948, he was briefly arrested as part of one of Stalin's many purges, this one being specifically of Jews, who seemingly displayed a lack of loyalty. Thankfully, word got out to the wider international community, and Pechersky's reputation led to fierce international pressure. He was released a short time later. Despite this, he was, quite rightly, awarded the For Battle Merit Medal in 1949. He would be denied a further two times from speaking at international trials related to the Holocaust and Sobibor in particular. Sasha Percherski died on the 19th of January 1990 in Rostov at the age of 80. A memorial to him stands in Tel Aviv, Israel, for his gallant actions in the escape. Leon Feldhendler returned to Lublin and went into hiding. Sadly, Leon was shot on the 2nd of April 1945 as someone attempted to break into his flat. He managed to get his family and escape, but he died four days later in hospital. He was 34 years old. The last known survivor of Sobibor, Simon Rosenfeld, died on the 3rd of June, 2019, in Tel Aviv, at the age of 96. Today, the site of the Sobibor camp can still be recognised by a couple of the former buildings that formed part of the Vorlager, these buildings are now mostly private dwellings. The ramp next to the railway can still be discerned, and, as the years have gone by, the extermination area has been slowly rediscovered and mapped. Today, you can walk the same path that so many others did on their final journey to the extermination area. An experience, I am sure, will feel eerie and a deep melancholic sadness. A museum and memorial now stands partially on the site of Lager Zwei also. Although I have no Jewish connections in my family that I know of, I certainly wish to go to Sobibor at some point to pay my respects to the quarter million people so coldly murdered in the name of an evil and sick ideology and the mass genocide that it led to. I shall leave you with the names of the 60 survivors of the Sobibor revolt.
Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative and interesting. If you did, please hit the like button and help it reach a wider audience and bring them into the fold of the Dark Legion. Come, join us. What did you think of today's video? Let me know in the comments below. And here we are, one year on from my first upload. I have to say, it doesn't feel like it's been a year, but I guess I must be getting old. And yes, I made you wait a full year before I covered another camp. My apologies. My very first upload, the Treblinka video, although I did not know it at the time, began a new full-time job for me. And here we are, all 40,000 of us. I'd say that's a respectable growth for any channel's first year. It's certainly far above my wildest expectations. Finally, a job where I don't have to answer to anyone. Despite what certain commenters seem to think. I confess I had to laugh recently when I read a comment on the Einsatzgruppen video that complained that such things were getting boring. Hmm. Only problem was that this comment was written in German. You're not exactly helping your case there, pal. Oh dear. Well, I'm going to drink a very large smoky scotch in celebration and in hope of many more years to come and a huge thank you to all of my subscribers and regular commenters that have kept on with me throughout this last year. You are now under strict orders to never stop being awesome, and may the gods smile on you always. Skoll! If you wish to do so, you can support DID on Patreon, link in the description, or via the Super Thanks button, and help me keep on making these videos for your delectation. Or you can pop over to my merch store on Teespring and grab yourself some sweet swag and let everyone know you're one of the Dark Legion. A huge thank you to my current patrons. You are the best and I love you all. I have had an idea floating around in my head for a long time now in which I would compile and adapt my scripts from the various serial killer videos into a book entitled Serial Killers A Compendium and publish over several volumes. I would include all new information and subsequent corrections that I have learned since. Patrons of the channel would be automatically entitled to a signed copy if they wish. Is this something that you would like to see, or better still, buy? Again, let me know. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves, and I shall see you on our next descent into darkness.